Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the ERISA webinar, The Life of Addresses. Uh, they always, they all, addresses have very interesting biographies and we should get to know them better. Um, this is, this uh, webinar is sponsored by ERISA's Location Enterprise Addressing and Public Safety Committee. And I hope that uh, this gives you useful information and maybe entices you to learn more and come and join our committee. So we have a slam bang lineup today of me, Ed Wells, and Lauren Di Giovanni, Hillary Palmer, Charmaine Baynard, Kara Utter, and Eve Legere. Um, what we want to do today is talk about addresses and take, take as a starting point that they're a foundation for how information is tracked, located, and mapped. They're particularly important in GIS. Very few GIS feature layers have so many cross dependencies as addresses. They're used by all kinds of improbable applications in an organization. So once issued and created at the local level, they often take on lives of their own as they're used by different programs and systems. So today we'll talk about addresses, why and when they're made and retired, and some of their many uses. Uh, we'll, we'll follow an example. We'll, we'll start with some basic principles and general observations about what an address is and why they're made and um, when they're made and what guides their creation. So uh, Lauren will be taking the, uh, the first part and Lauren, would you kind of introduce yourself and take us through these next few slides? Great, yeah, thanks Ed. Uh, my name is Lauren DiGiovanni. Uh, I'm a client success manager. Um, my background has mostly been in GIS um, and GIS and public safety. So um, my perspective for some of this presentation will be kind of the public safety side, because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, and I'm really excited to present today. If you see me turn off my camera, it's because I'm having some bandwidth issues, so I apologize. All right, let's get started. Um, so what is an address? So I think a lot of us are familiar with the basics of addressing, right? So we can see on here, like the most common at the top here, you know, 123 Main Street, Lewis, uh, Kansas, 67552. We've got the zip code and everything there. Uh, we have a couple other examples as well here. And then also let's talk about what's not considered an address, okay? So um, coordinates, lat long, um, linear referencing locations, computer system addresses. Let's, let's look at that a little bit more closely. And can you go to the next slide, please? All right, so here we have our definition of an address and we need to have a definition so that we can understand what fits inside the definition and what does not, you know, what's, what's something different that doesn't apply. So um, a definition of an address, an address specifies a geographic location by reference to a thoroughfare or landmark, or it specifies a point of postal delivery. So again, here we see those addresses again, okay? So the first example, that 123, that's like a street address. That's one of our basic street addresses. An Empire State Building, you know, that's a landmark or building. A lot of us know some of these big landmarks, Empire State Building, um, you know, uh, Sears Tower, things like that. Also, P.O. boxes are considered an address. So, you know, you have your P.O. box, um, your city and your state and your zip as well. Uh, residential addresses, so that, that Tanglewood Drive, that's a good residential address. You can see there's a little range there. Um, and sometimes we get a bit more complex with these addresses, right? We have a couple ranges um, to represent a couple of different locations there. Um, but you can see that, you know, all of these have uh, the state and they have, for the most part, the city. Um, zip code were available. So these are some good components to have in you know, the definition of what we consider to be an, an address. Okay, next slide. All right, um, so for, um, we went through that, that definition, um, but I think it's important, you know, talking about addressing referencing systems, right? So this is referring to the thoroughfare landmark or postal delivery point. Um, Ed is actually gonna go through this more in detail, but I just wanna introduce the concept of the address referencing system here. Um, I think what's important to understand is it doesn't include you know, a coordinate, a linear reference or computer locations. So let's talk about why. So you know, especially for coordinates and linear um, referencing systems, human readability is just not there. So a coordinate, you know, numerical, it's not really easily understood or remembered by most people. I don't think I've ever met anybody that says, you know, hey, I live at, you know, 180 West or not 180, maybe like 170 West and, 
you know, whatever, whatever coordinate system you're at. I don't think I've ever had anybody come to me and say that that's where I live. Um, so it's just not something that easily be remembered, right? But we can remember 123 Sycamore Street. That's much easily remembered. So addresses are using, you know, familiar names and formats, which makes it a lot more intuitive as people as we're relaying this information to others. Um, contextually, you know, addresses provide context. So the name of the street, the city, the country, in our minds, because we have this, you know, contextual knowledge, we're able to kind of piece together, you know, we hear the country, okay, I know where that country is, you might have knowledge of like a region or state, that kind of, that hierarchy allows you to, to build up um, in your mind, kind of your own spatial map and have the context there. Um, obviously, a lot of us use addresses for mail delivery. Okay, so coordinates, linear referencing systems, not the greatest for mail delivery, right? We don't deliver mail to a coordinate. Um, persistent and flexibility. A coordinate is great for precision, right? That can give us, especially as you know, we start going into the decimals there, we can get really, really precise with a coordinate. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of flexibility there. You know, having a, a more standard address, we have more flexibility, but as we go through this presentation, we, we, we're gonna learn that we wanna use this flexibility for good, right? We don't wanna use, sometimes being too flexible can be a problem. So we wanna have some flexibility, but also have some standards and some, you know, authoritative, um, authoritative backgrounds to wrap ourselves in this address, okay? Um, and then lastly, um, coordinates and linear referencing systems, not really an address because, you know, the legal administrative use, you know, addresses are used in legal and administrative uh, documents for property identification and billing and other purposes. And they just lack that, the coordinate like, you know, lacks the legal recognition and structure. Um, on here, we talk about, you know, coordinate reference systems, which refers to a grid, a spheroid or a geoid. A lot of us have, you know, pretty strong GIS background, but just to refresh, you know, sphero a spheroid, the Earth shape is not a perfect sphere, right? It's an oblate spheroid. And then the geoid represents the global mean sea level. So little refresher there, because honestly, I, I have a GIS background and I still have to kind of go back and refresh it. Uh, linear referencing systems, it can refer to a route, a beginning, a distance. Um, and then lastly, computer system addresses. So um, if you want to go do some research and learn more about addressing and you type in, you know, what is an address? Google's going to throw a lot of IP and Mac stuff at you just right off the bat, because that's the nature of the platform we're searching on, right? This is, you know, IP system. So um, an IP address would be something like, you know, a lot of us see like the three digits, period, three digits, and then a singular digit and then another digit. Um, or you have your Mac, which is like a series of, of a digit and often like a, a, a numeric or a, um, alpha character um, going through it. So those are just some examples um, and just trying to understand, you know, what an address truly is versus what it is not. So Ed, I'm going to hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. So what guide the creation of addresses? Well, there are three ways to, to approach that question. Uh, the address reference system, which consists of the rules by which addresses are generated and quality checked. The address authority, the business process by which addresses are assigned and retired. And the address repository, the spatial relational database that organizes authoritative address records. And they're all important to keep in mind. And they're part of what makes addressing, which seems so simple when you're five years old and you can remember your address, really complicated when you get, get into it. So I wanna talk first about the address reference system. And as, as Lauren pointed out, this is a model of rules by which we, do, we can express a location. It's different from the coordinate reference system, which is a whole di completely different model. It's different from linear reference systems. It's different from network, you know, computer networks. It has a particular way and framework of rules that relate a point, a feature, a something to either a thoroughfare or to a landmark name that's well known or to a point of postal delivery, which is all defined in the postal world. They all come, come to us as addresses and they all have to be dealt with in the same database. So what are the rules? What, what are those rules? Can you catalog them? Can you make a standard list? Well, you can. If you go and look at a whole bunch of different um, address ordinances and manuals uh, and policies, you'll find that there are always rules about address numbering, how far apart are they, which side, you know, which is even, which is odd. Um, 
about street naming. When do you use different street types or, you know, how do you, how do you determine whether two names sound too much alike? Uh, street types and directions and modifiers. Do you have quadrants? Do you have um, zones? Do you have modifiers at the end? Uh, sub addresses, more and more sub addresses are becoming important. And also rules about what place names uh, apply to a given area within your area of jurisdiction. When we get to grids, there are rules about block definition and grids, about baselines and polylines and break lines. And then each, as you compile the set of rules for your area, you'll want to uh, compile them into a document and you want to give that, you want to say, who is the authority that created this? And you want to say, what area does it cover? And give it a name and, and probably an ID, particularly if, you have, if you're dealing with more than one. And tie that back all to the reference documents that make these rules official or make them absolute policy for, for your operation. So that's the essence of the address reference system. It's really a set of rules. There's no spatial um, zero point that defines all addresses, just like there's no spatial zero point that defines all the coordinate reference systems. Each one has its own. So that's the essence of the address reference system. Let's take a look about how, at how they work out because they follow some, some interesting principles. So taken together, the rules and the elements define the spatial reference system. Roads are named paths through space. Numbers show where along a road something is located. And that's how we tie these rules, how they enable us to navigate our way through space by inferring patterns and finding our way. That's why they are so widely used and why they are much better for most people than coordinates. You put coordinates along a road, people have tried it and it does not do well for navigation. So if you look at a lot of the different patterns that addresses fall into or that they, they show when you look at an address point map in, an, in a given area, you'll find they fall into three different types. The first type and the most common is the grid-based address reference system. You have a point of beginning like that circle there and that's where the, all the numbering begins from. That's where number one starts. And you have an axis and that sort of is your ruler and all the streets that run parallel to that sort of are numbered in parallel to that axis. You have what I'll call a baseline, which would be the uh, street that goes through the zero point and starts shows where all those parallel lines shows them where their numbering begins. So they all keep in parallel with the axis. And then the cross streets are breakpoints. They show where the breakpoints are between blocks often. They can, they don't have to. There are different ways of dealing with blocks. But that's the grid system that we all know and love. Second one is what I'll call route-based address reference systems. It's, you find it in mountainous terrain or rugged terrain where the road network is sparse and there aren't very many intersections. And so the simplest thing to do is just to give every point, every street its own point of beginning. And that's where you begin number one. So in this particular area, you can see where the red dots are. It's a point of intersection that's, that's defined as the point of beginning for that road. And you start with one there and you go all the way to the end, wherever it ends. It doesn't matter where it intersects any other road. It just keeps on going until you get to the end of the road. And that's, that's all there is to it. They're just too far apart to form a grid out of them. So that's the route-based ARS. And you find that way out beyond the suburbs. And then lastly is a, is a particular, is a kind of a rare case, but it comes up every so often and you just have to know how to deal with it. What I call area-based address reference system. So where numbers are assigned within an area, they're not, they don't pay attention to the streets at all. It's pretty rare but you sometimes find it in trailer courts, in campsites, pretty rare in the US, I should say. Uh, military bases, Puerto Rican urbanization, similar developments. This little area in New York started out as a summer campsite 150 years ago. And they just in a bunch of campsites, numbered them and had paths between them. And eventually over decades, that grew into a piece of private property and they then eventually they, they closed up the camp and sold off the lots and they kept the numbering. So if you look at the bottom, uh, the bottom 
right corner here, you see the number two, 2B, they're in sector B. And it comes up to 19, it comes back down to 20, and it just finds its way over by zigzag all the way over here to 149. And then it jumps and it comes into the 200s right over here. Has nothing to do with the streets whatsoever. So when you come on one of these in your area, this is how you deal with it. If you're trying to figure out how it fits with your address reference system, you just give it its own little thing and then try and persuade them to do some renumbering along the streets so it makes sense to everybody. It's, it's kind of hard to find stuff. You have to know somebody or uh, know who to ask to find anything in there. So it makes it hard to navigate. So those are the three kinds of uh, address reference systems. They're, they're important because they ensure that locations are specified uniquely. They specify locations by reference to the road network so we can navigate to them. And they organize them according to rules that are consistent and intuitive so people can infer the patterns. They're also the basis for QC. Think about this. If you think something is wrong, how can you say something is wrong if you don't have a rule that states what is right? These are the rules that tell you what is right and what is wrong. So they're the basis for QC. We have the address authority. It creates, it updates, and it retires addresses within an area. There are two key roles, address coordinator, data steward. The address coordinator manages the business processes. It's typically done by planning or public works or permits. The data steward manages the master address data repository. That's, uh, they handle data maintenance, QA, and publication. And that's typically an IT GIS responsibility. And all of these powers and duties are delegated by an ordinance or a policy document or both. Typically the best, uh, best mix is to have a broad and general ordinance that says, the uh, director of planning will be in charge of address policy. And then the director of planning can, can uh, write up the rules and if they need to be changed, he can do it without having to go back to the political body. So you've got an ordinance and a policy. And they, the, uh, the addressing authority manages the workflows. Street name review, address number assignment, dealing with sub addresses, infrastructure, special cases. And some keys for success here, begin by documenting your ARS and build that into your policy and your GIS. Secondly, timing. When do you start a street name? When do you, when do you assign an address? As soon as possible. Make it part of the subdivision approval process. Make it before the building permit is issued. Things happen there before anything is actually built on a site. Somebody drives up and gets bitten by a snake and needs to call 911. What's the address? It's better to have it than not. Second, be consistent. Create a policy manual that formalizes the ARS rules and then keep records of special cases so that you decide everything in a consistent way. And then make that information readily available throughout your organization and to the public so that everybody knows what the rules are. Provide consistent information across the organization and to the public. And the key to that, in addition to the administrative process of publishing the rules, is the address repository. So let's take a look at what that's comprised of. You have your basic building block, Lego, Lego blocks for com constructing addresses, the address number, the distance marker or the milepost, Complete street name, landmark names, sub addresses, place names. There's usually a set of place names that applies to a given uh, address and often a set of street names as well because you've got alias names. You've got the UPS, uh, USPS delivery elements and they roll up to a complete address with an address ID. And they also roll up to the road center lines and the nodes and segments that comprise that network. The nodes themselves are intersections those are addresses. And the segments contain the address ranges that we know as tiger ranges or the, the even and odd ranges. And they also, in my opinion at least, and in the opinion of the federal um, FTDC address standard, form an address in and of themselves. Where are you? I'm on the 900 block of Milton Street. So these elements then are composed into records. And these records have different structures. And they're are a surprisingly small number of structures when you get right down to it. There are these particular nine uh, structures and they each have a different syntax. So they have a different data table that will hold them. And you can, I don't wanna go into this, this is not the time or place, but uh, 
if you want to go into that more, there's a whole workshop that ERISA provides on this, and, and that's part of it. These then uh, are related to map features. You've got your address points. You've got your road centerline network. You've got your places with their boundaries and the places, uh, the points, the address points are within or outside of, of given places and the centerline network uh, crosses or doesn't, doesn't intersect the boundary. So that's your base, that's the core of your address repository. Uh, with that, since I've given you some, some, the principles of good, Lauren will now take us into the realm of not so good. Lauren? Yeah, thank you, Ed. Um, so <laughs> what are bad addresses? Um, this is both my favorite and not so favorite um, from public safety perspective. So um, bad addresses, addresses that are not authoritative, right? We need to make sure that we have um, a singular authority to, us, to help us stay within the confines of what should be like a good address, considered a good address, right? doesn't fit the pattern or system of addresses around them. So, you know, intuitively as people, we look for patterns as we're interacting with data streams coming in. And it is really difficult, especially for a first responder, if, you know, there's, there's really no rhyme or reason to what they're seeing around them. Um, addresses that are confusing to say, um, pronounce, write, or understand. So, um, it's really, you know, some of us have seen these street names where, you know, they, the developer or the planner thought they were being cute in creating these street names. Um, but ultimately, it leads to a lot of inefficiencies and wasted time and spelling um, or, you know, writing or understanding, especially if we have like really, really, really long, excessively long street names can be a challenge. Um, Sorry, just to go back on the, the not authoritative, I just, one of the examples that comes to mind for like a not authoritative address would be like, you know, a farmer owns a farm and he wants to honor his wife and he's got a lot of land and he's got this dirt road and he's like, I'm going to call this Mary's Lane, right? Well, that's really sweet, but not really helpful if it's not authoritative, if it doesn't really fit what's around it. So that's one of the examples I think of when I think of not authoritative. Um, let's see, the duplicate, you know, what's duplicated within an area such that no part of the full address is unique. So in my experience, there are certain um, types of areas that that we tend to see this more often. So like a large residential complex, office parks, informal settlements, historical areas, these are areas that are more prone to having um, duplications, not necessarily on purpose. It's, it's just something where they, you know, time was not taken to recognize that we really need to add, you know, a level of specificity to differentiate one building from the next. Um, especially mobile home parks. We see that a lot with mobile home parks. So um, if you're maintaining a data set with mobile home parks, I'd really take a good look and figure out, you know, if it works with, you know, the, the, the standard that you're using for your area and, you know, the addressing authority, you know, is there an opportunity to improve the mobile home park to add like another layer of um, uniqueness to those addresses? All right, slide. Okay, um, so here is an example that is local to me. So I actually happen to live in this neighborhood. And you can see here, we have, you know, West 67th Avenue, West 67th Court, West 67th uh, Place, West 67th Way, West 67th Circle, West 67th Drive. Now in a vacuum, if we had just one of these, it's actually, they're, they're pretty decent. You know, sometimes direct, you know, prefix directionals, not always, not always helpful, but um, you know, I think of what three words, right? And a lot of us are familiar where there's this grid that's, you know, on the globe and it's three meters by three meters and every three meter cell has its own unique combination of three words. If we can cover the entire globe with a unique combination of three words to include like the, the Pacific Ocean, I feel like, you know, as people, we can get much more creative with some of our street names. So when I see something like this, I'm kind of like, this is a lost opportunity to become imaginative and come up with some names, especially because this is not an unincorporated area. This is a, you know, a defined municipal area. So, you know, it's, we are able to utilize a, a whole, a whole dictionary of words and having it be within a city that has, you know, specific zip codes, those also add an extra layer of protection to ensure that these addresses are in fact unique. So 
I always like to show my neighborhood because I do think it's kind of hilarious. You know, packages do get mixed up from time to time for this exact reason, right? So that's a fun example that I like to show. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, as I said, I came from back, or I'm currently in public safety and I also have a background working for a, a public safety answering point. So I think a lot about public safety. Um, one of my favorite examples is there is a street name called Highview Drive. Now, if somebody's calling in 911 and they say, I'm on Highview Drive, that call taker is really going to start typing H-I-G-H, -H, right? Because intuitively, by comparing, you know, high and view, we're thinking H-I-G-H -H space V-I-E-W. Um, but actually, this street is H-Y dash V-U. Um, additionally, there is the hyphen in there. Um, so that can be problematic in a computer-aided dispatch system. So we just want to be thinking about these things as we're creating these names, you know, in um, making sure that we're thinking about this address, how it's going to be utilized across the board. So I like to show Highview Drive. Another example here on the right is Country Club Drive. <laughs> I've seen, I'm seeing the, 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 the chats, it's kind of making me chuckle. Um, Country Club Drive. So this is um, a region in which it's really common practice for them to actually name the entire uh, neighborhood, like one singular name. And then they just kind of add on like a suffice to like try to differentiate one section from another. So um, it's it might be a little challenging to see on your screen, um, but if you could zoom in, you would see that um, the houses in this, this northern section, it's going 2C, 3C, 4C, 5C, all the way around. A couple things going on here. First of all, we have um, both parodies on the same side of the street. Now, some ways you can kind of make that work, but one of the big problems here is we're not really allowing ourselves room for growth. If, if we're going to put addresses on the north side of the street, we've already used, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. So what are we gonna, what are we gonna do now, right? Um, additionally, it's Country Club Drive C, like that's like the name of that area. The address itself, when it's written out, like on their mail is 8C Country Club Drive. If I'm calling in 911 and I have to say, I'm at 8C Country, Country Club Drive, they might be like, call taker might be like, did you, did you say 80? No, no, 8C, you know, 8C as in cat. Um, and they might be like, 8C as in cat road, what, what is, the, you know, it, it's just, it's an added layer of confusion, right? We don't want to introduce this. Additionally, in this area, um, you'll see here this road name says East Circle. So even though these homes are known as 8C Country Club Drive, the signage on their street is saying East Circle. And they've done that because down here they have a West Circle and that's where all of the B addresses are. So, you know, when a developer is creating this, they, they to them might be like, oh, well, this makes sense. You know, this makes sense. But at least for your first responders, this is not a very intuitive location to respond to. And we have the addressing authority who has the standards and they can follow these standards and enforce them. We can really prevent situations like this from happening. So um, this is just something which is a please, please, please don't do this um, from the public safety perspective. So um, Ed, back to you. So yes, we all have our stories and um... It's just unbelievable what people do when they're just not thinking about things as being part of a larger system. And the reason they're so fundamental that system is because they're used for so many purposes. Wayfinding, codes, situs, delivery of goods and services. That's what we're going to take up next. Um, I will lead off with, since we've heard about the bad, I'll, I'll lead off with the worst case, no addresses. Uh, this is the part where I introduce myself first. I've, I've been involved with addressing for about 20 years now. And I got started in this when I was, uh, I, most of my career has been with large local government agent, GIS agencies as a GIS analyst and manager. And at some point, Census Bureau re, re, released a census, uh, an address standard. And I happened to be involved in an addressing project in DC where I was working at the time. And we realized the standard was not gonna fly. And the end result of that was we wrote a letter criticizing it and they said, well, do you wanna try? So I got involved writing the FDDC address standard along with a, a number of other people. And that led over time, that was eventually adopted. It took 
a lot longer than we ever thought it would. And that led to work with Nina on their standards. And I've been involved with addressing and address standards now for, like I said, about 20 years. Um, my wife also, my wife has a small consulting firm that is also in the addressing business. We have very interesting conversations over breakfast and dinner. And she is working on a project now, and I signed on as a field manager to provide addresses in the Virgin Islands where there are none right now. And it's given me a, a look at what happens if you don't have addresses. There are no street signs, no numbers on the houses, and you can't tell people where you are. Not easily. You don't have reference point for navigation. Others can't find you, and you can't validate your location. So you can't call a cab. A university dean had to walk a quarter mile to, a, to an intersection if he wanted to ride to the airport to go off to a conference uh, because he couldn't tell any cab driver where his house was up in the small lane where he lived. The ambulances, I mean, we started the project and the Lieutenant Governor walked in for the kickoff meeting and said, we're so glad you're here. Last week, somebody died because the ambulance couldn't find them. Uh, you can't report, how do you report an internet outage and get service or a, a power outage? I was walking down the street, assigning addresses along a street and with my little handheld device and a guy walks by and looks at that and says, what you doing? And I explain, and he says, brother, I love you. I work for the internet service provider here and I spent all afternoon trying to find some lady who had a service outage and I never found her. So that's pretty important. People can't find you, Amazon does not deliver in the Virgin Islands. You cannot order something by Amazon. FedEx doesn't work there unless you, and because uh, they can't deliver to PO boxes and that's how people get their mail. Um, we went looking for an Airbnb that we'd rented and we got confused and we ended up in front of the wrong house. And if somebody driving by hadn't sort of asked what we're doing, uh, she had to make three phone calls and then she figured out where the, where the owner was and how we were just around the corner, but we had no way of knowing we were that close or that far away. A restaurant supplier said, you know, we're out of something right now and I can't get a supplier here because they don't know where we are to, to, uh, get more of whatever they were out of. There's no Uber, no ride sharing because they have no, no addresses to navigate by. All sorts of things just don't happen. You can't verify your location. So after Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, the FEMA damage claims were delayed in immeasurably because they were no, there were no addresses. So you get to the form that says address, you got nothing to put in. Census has the same problem conducting a census. Uh, school administration, election administration is complicated. What do you put on your personal ID, your driver's license? Uh, and mail delivery, you just gotta go to a PO box. So that's what happens when you have no addresses. With that, I'll turn it over to um, Hillary. Is it you that's taking this one? We weren't sure. It is Kara. Kara. We'll turn it over to Kara Utter. Yes. Sorry, Kara. That's okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Kara Utter, and I am a GIS consultant, and I have worked with local government for about seven and a half years now. And I currently do maintain uh, current 911 GIS data for different counties, as well as helping them transition into NG911. So that's my experience in this world. And I wanted to bring in rural areas, not, not necessarily as um, case studies, but I really want these to be situations to consider. Because the biggest thing I want for people to take away from this slide is that we need to be thinking about these issues because even if we are in areas where we have the control to maybe work with the authoritative addressing uh, departments, there's a lot of rural areas that still don't have mappers, they don't have GIS, uh, they are utilizing different various ways of dispatching emergency services that are challenging now, but they're working through ad hoc ways. Uh, and they're going to be even more challenging when it comes to the standardized system of NG911. What will that look like? What, who's gonna change? Will these agencies change? Are we even working with these agencies? I can tell you in my area, when it comes to the forest service, I'm in a county where public lands make up 92% of the land in our county. And I can tell you that nobody is working with these agencies right now when it comes to the ideas of NG911 and standardizing different ways of 
dispatching emergency situations, but we need to be. And so these are the things I want you to think about when I just go through some, some of the, the, some of the use cases that are occurring now. So every rural area, they're at, at their own level of preparedness when it comes to addressing within a dispatch center. In many counties throughout Idaho, uh, dispatch will describe directions to a location to emergency services based on CAD maps or Google maps. They'll describe that via the radio because uh, the people who are responding don't have mobile terminals within their vehicles. Uh, many, many places maintain their own addressing and have very accurate addressing and some don't. So there's varying degrees of accuracy and completeness when it comes to addressing in rural, rural areas. And that's true throughout the USA. I'm adjacent to a county who had no addressing at all in, in a database format until recently when the state started stepping in here in Idaho and helping from the top down, different counties start thinking about NG911 preparedness, but not all states are so lucky. And then when it comes to wildland fire, and or emergencies happening on public lands or the federal lands that are surrounding a lot of us. There's the forest dispatch center and then there's the local government dispatch centers and they collaborate sometimes on incidents and one communicates in a certain coordinate system while the other one communicates in a different coordinate system. But they do communicate through coordinate systems, uh, forest service road names, uh, they will often go to PLS grid systems, or they will utilize grids on commonly known forest maps. They'll use whatever they can to get the, the units to the incident that they need to respond to. And even if addressing exists on structures within the forest, that's not often used in the dispatching centers. Uh, so my husband will sometimes volunteer to do night dispatch for the Forest Service, and I've worked with the dispatch at the counties, and so this is why uh, I'm bringing up these very specific details for this uh, from firsthand knowledge. Place names are often used. There's a lot of inholdings that are private lands surrounded by forests, and even if those are addressed at the county level with authoritative addressing, it's the inholding name that's often used. And the inholding name in itself is, as we've learned, the location name is an address and it's, it's a proper address. However, it is really well known within the Forest Service, within departments and staff within a Forest Service because they work in the forest and they look at those maps all the time. But if, you're, if you are communicating a place name to maybe an ambulance or the fire crews that are going to be out go, going out to respond to something they don't always know those place names so then it's the the collaborative details that may not be understood fully and completely on both sides of different agencies when the collaboration hasn't been hasn't had a strong foundation from the ground up in the building of a system and an addressing system that would be complete for interdepartmental as well as interagency communication. And so these are the things we need to think about. Uh, I do have one other thing, uh, uh, talking about uh, rural Nebraska volunteer firefighters, because my husband also owned a ranch in Nebraska for 13 years, and he was on the rural uh, volunteer firefighting crew. And currently his brother is still ranching in Nebraska and is still on that firefighting crew. So I got some information based on that. They don't communicate via PLSS, uh, even if their, their um, acreage and their different pastures are ending at certain corners. They may know that. They may need to look that up on their, their documentation. Other people won't know that. And so that's not something that they communicate with. Uh, they don't trust addressing in Google or Apple Maps. And they said that it's just often incorrect. So they don't utilize addressing from those systems either. They don't have mobile terminal devices assigned to them from any emergency dispatching centers. And so what happens is dispatch will call the lead volunteer firefighter and they will tell them that there's a fire in um, north of intersection something. So a known intersection. They will say the fire is north of this intersection and that gets the ball rolling. So the lead firefighters, then they call the crew, they get in the engine and they start driving in that direction towards that intersection and looking north of that intersection. And what they do is they look for the smokestack because I don't know how many people are familiar with rural Nebraska, but it's rolling hills and grasslands. 
And so there isn't a lot to obstruct your view of a smokestack, even at night. It's it's really um, visible most of the time. They don't really have issues with that. And so they drive in the direction, they see the smokestack, they get to a point where they want to turn and drive directly straight bird's eye view towards that fire. Sometimes they utilize different roads that are on somebody's land. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they cut right through the fencing and drive right through the grassland to the fire straight on. And when I asked if there was ever any conflict about that, there's never been any conflict because everybody knows that somebody would rather the fire get put out that's on their land than, you know, go through any of these issues with, you know, I can't believe you cut down my fence. You owe me sort of a situation. So there's no hard feelings around that. It's just this overall understanding that that is something that could happen. Uh, and the fire crews are usually ranchers themselves. So they'll make sure that the cattle don't get out and they'll move them to a different pasture. <laughs> so um, these are really interesting different use cases. And so what my husband and I did to test out the accurateness of the addressing, even in, in Google, I have an Android, he's got an iPhone. So we used Google and um, Apple Maps. And at his old address, uh, his old property where he used to be, and his pin was different than my pin. My pin was different whether I put a West designator in front of the road name. When I didn't, it was more accurate, even though the directional uh, the directional um, street prefix was actually the accurate road name. Me typing it in without that made the pin more accurately place closer to the home instead of on a river on the property. And so this varying levels of completeness and the different systems that people will use and the way that we need to communicate and coordinate with different agencies, it, the levels of, I mean, the level of processes that people are doing right now currently. And I can tell you, my, my husband's brother has not even heard of NG911. And so these are just the things I want us all to think about, situations to consider when it comes to coordinating with different, different teams who maybe volunteer, maybe not, different agencies who maybe have land surrounding all of your, your local government municipalities uh, within your county boundaries. Where are they at now? Do they know what's happening? Do we need to have a conversation? Do we need to have more meetings? Uh, and so that's, that's really where I wanted to go with this slide. So one, one lesson I draw from this, Kara, is that there are four kinds of, of spatial reference systems. There's the addressing, there's the naming, there's the coordinates, there's the linear referencing. They've all got their limits. Mm -hmm. They complement each other. And GIS is the only system that can integrate all four and therefore form a basis for the collaboration that is so important. Yeah, I love that takeaway, Ed. Thank you. Let's go to Alaska. Hillary? Hey, everybody. Um, first of all, there's 127 of you on the phone. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us. Please put into the chat where you're joining us from. We would love to know what state you're in um, and maybe if, if you're finding the webinar helpful so far or if you came with some specific questions in mind, um, we would love to consider those for future webinars. Um, so, yep. Yeah. My name is Hillary Palmer. I am a geospatial program manager for Dewberry, which is an engineering firm based in the DC area. Um, and I'm up here in Alaska. I have lived in Alaska for 34 years. It is home. It's it's where I suspect my kids will grow up and, and live their lives as well. It's just a wonderful, wild place. Uh, pros and cons to being wild, right? Sometimes that means we just don't have a lot of government oversight into what goes on. And so the, the image here that you see, the map of Alaska, that white area is something called the unorganized borough. What does that mean? That We don't have counties up here. Uh, we have boroughs and cities. Um, so the unorganized borough is a place. It takes up about 70% of the state's land area. It ranks fourth highest in population. The unorganized borough is, there's no local government. It's everybody fending for themselves. 
Um, the problem with that is that they lack address data. There is no addressing authority. There's no platting board. There's no um, property taxation. There, there's nothing. You can do what you want. There's no codes. There's no permitting. Uh, so it's it's a really it's a really unique place. Um, but but the the downside of that is there's nobody looking after these communities to assign their addresses in a place that makes sense for everybody. Um, actually, the duty of providing for the um, uh, functions of local government in this area, it's part of our Alaska state constitution. Um, it says the legislature shall provide for the performance of services it deems necessary or advisable in un unorganized boroughs. And um, until I started talking about this issue in our state capital of Juneau, many legislators themselves were not even aware that it was their job to be the local government for this part of the state. So um, ever since I learned that for myself, I've just been sharing that little nugget of information and hoping that they do start to provide for these critical services. Like you mentioned, Ed, when when a disaster hits and people are applying for uh, individual assistance grants from FEMA, all of those forms require an address. And if you can't enter a an address into those forms that fits whatever the, the website creator deems uh, suitable, it gets flagged for further review, which delays the reimbursement. It often, uh, often by a year or more, because there's so many that need special one-on-one -on -one review. So it's, it's a major problem. Uh, in in most of the unorganized borough, for example, mail will be delivered to the airport with just the person's name, maybe the color of their house, and the name of the community. And people have to sort through things to find what they need to find. And as you can imagine, if you're expecting a, a, a mail order pharmacy shipment and it's missing, that's a that's a problem. Um, so many, many, many challenges exist because of this lack of local government in Alaska. But it is what it is. It's it's a unique place up here. Uh, and I should have talked a little bit about my background. Sorry, I, I got off on the unorganized borough. I've been doing GIS for about 14 years now, background at DOT, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and before I came to Dewberry, I was the E911 addressing officer for my local government, <clears throat> excuse me, here, which is called the Matnuska Susitna Borough, Matsu Borough. Kids went back to school last week. And I'm fighting a little bit of a cold, so I'm so sorry that you have to listen to me. But let's go ahead and move to the next slide <clears throat> because there's a really fun story to tell about how addresses saved the day. There. Um, thank you, Ed. So you may or may not be familiar with the BEAD program, Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, uh, two years ago or so. It was a $42 billion pot of funding that was going to be allocated according to level of need to ensure that all Americans had access to the internet at broadband speeds, right? $42 billion. And how were they going to make sure that that was allocated to each of the states according to need? Well, um, they tried to build a data fabric of every single broadband serviceable location, BSL fabric. So every single location that is a candidate for broadband service needed to be mapped. And they attempted to do this at a nationwide level, which of course posed challenges because um, like, like Kara mentioned, rural America has some specific considerations that made it really challenging to put together that data fabric. And the E and bead is equity. So there were some serious problems. So what happened when this program started um, standing up is each state had to create a brand new office of broadband, broadband office for the state. That's a challenge for state government to talk to the right people to create the legislation or to get funding, to redo org charts, to hire an executive director. It took a lot of time for the states to stand up a broadband office. 
And then for the broadband officer to get on board, you know, he's, he or she has just been hired. They're reading about bead program funding requirements and they're saying, oh my gosh, I need to do what? I need to build my own BSL fabric for my state and compare two geospatial data sets by using a spreadsheet of challenges that I need to make. And there are deadlines for these data challenges. Why we're comparing two spatial data sets by using a spreadsheet is a topic for another webinar. But it was basically um, a very short suspense, high stakes, try to secure the biggest piece of this $42 billion pie that you can. Um, and in Alaska, it was just too much of a challenge to get you know, state officials to understand the urgency and the need and, and the, the level of effort that it was going to take to build a BSL fabric for Alaska using our own local government authoritative addresses and then compare that with what the federal government had developed and then propose some data challenges. I'm challenging this BSL because you have wrong address, wrong uh, structure type, residential versus commercial, um, wrong level of service, uh, you know, which is internet speed that's being provided at that location. You have it on the wrong structure within the parcel. So there was there was probably about a dozen different challenge codes that you needed to determine and prioritize them. Each challenge was a different row in the spreadsheet. Spreadsheets could be no more than 250,000 rows each. So you had to break your data challenges into multiple spreadsheets. It was a nightmare. So the Alaska story is that, wow, for the first time ever, addressing was front and center in the spotlight. Um, and it really brought a lot of awareness to the data gaps that existed. Um, and it really forced us to get creative in how we solve those. So a nonprofit um, uh, philanthropic entity up here in Alaska called the Rasmussen Foundation stepped in, they saw the need, they had the funding, they had, um, you know, quick procurement mechanisms. And they said, hey, Alaska Broadband Office, you tell me what you need and I support you. And so, um, I had the opportunity to use GIS data to challenge the FCC's map of Alaska, and we were successful in bringing $1.01 billion to our state for the purpose of expanding broadband access across all of our, dis you know, uh, many of our communities, probably 80% or more are off the road system. You can only fly there or take a boat there in the summer. Uh, it, it's just a super challenging place to deploy broadband. And so the fact that the federal government was saying, hey, we're going to cover all of your capital expenses uh, was was huge. So we we had, I mean, you saw the unorganized borough map, right, where there was no address data. So how are we going to make sure that we're equitably accounting for those areas? We partnered with Ecopia who used our only statewide satellite imagery mosaic and they did feature extraction and they extracted all the building footprints across the entire state. And we rapidly did a bunch of QC on that. And it was, it was the best we were gonna get in a very short amount of time. It was a great product, the first of its kind that Alaska had ever seen. So we used the building footprint data and extracted a centroid for each building footprint. And we used that as the basis for our BSL fabric map for the entire unorganized borough, as well as some other areas where we were pretty sure there was some addressing in place, but it was too hard to find the right person to talk to. We're running out of time, 42 billion on the line. So that data set was clutch. And so we we used the building footprint feature extraction um, that Ecopia provided, and then we used um, here at Dewberry we 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 grabbed that data and we also scraped and conflated data from local governments, and um, that was a process uh, using FME software. Give me a reaction if you use FME. Um, you can also do the similar things in ArcGIS data interoperability extension. Yeah, it's like model builder on steroids. Love it. And so using all of these cutting edge tools, we were able to, to really in a short amount of time build 
a broadband serviceable location fabric for Alaska, be very clear about our methodology when we were submitting data challenges to the FCC so that they could say, uh, to the NTIA, and, and so that they could say, wow, okay, I mean, yeah, it looks like your data sources are probably better than our whatever they used, uh, which in some cases was LIDAR from 20, from 2007 that only existed in, yeah, it was, it was just a crazy project. Their, their first version of, of Alaska's BSL fabric was completely missing 69 of our communities. Just, they weren't even aware that 69 communities existed. So I mean, I really love this project because We're it was a chance for addresses to shine. Yep. All right. Thank you, Hillary. Sure. Next. Um, Eve, who are you and where are you going to take us? Hi there. Uh, I'm Eve Legier. I'm the uh, GIS manager for the city of St. John in uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Um, I've been GIS manager with the city for 24 years now. Prior to that, I did uh, five years with a couple of different regional planning commissions and also did some um, GIS consulting work in the Ivory Coast. Um, but I've been uh, working with addressing um, basically for, let's say, close to 30 years now. So um, in uh, at the city of St. John, we, we the GIS uh, staff are responsible for addressing, assigning addresses, creating them, maintaining them. Maintaining them. And um, what I wanted to, to talk about today is a use that uh, might not come to mind right away. Um, we create addresses mainly for 911 purposes for emergency response. And uh, we know they're used for delivery of services, um, you know, Amazon, FedEx, that's that kind of stuff. But one thing that kind of caught us off guard was a few years ago, the, uh, the financial institutions, uh, the banks, started requiring uh, valid civic addresses or confirmed valid civic addresses for before they'd release mortgage funds to folks. So um, what happened was we started getting all these calls from panicked citizens and and lawyers, um, you know that they couldn't access their their mortgage funds because the uh, the bank couldn't validate their address. So what we found out was the banks were using um, a data set from Canada Post. Now, when we assign addresses, we, uh, we notify Canada Post as soon as we create an address, uh, but they don't update their system right away. So that was uh, causing some real, real issues. Uh, next slide. So, like I said, we 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 were getting all these calls from panicked people, going from the bank to the city to, you know, can't get our money for our mortgage, and so uh, and then they they'd asked us for official letters that the the bank would be requiring official letters from the city to confirm their civic address, and you know that was causing a lot of increased workload on our part. So, um, next slide. Basically, what we did. Uh, we created a really simple but uh, effective uh, instant app. Well, before the instant apps were, were available, but a simple app using the tools at the time um, and called it City St. John Official Streets and Civic Addresses. Put that out to the public and we keep it up to date, updated as soon as we create addresses, that app is updated. And uh, we made realtors and uh, lawyers financial institutions aware of the app and basically uh, we we don't get any uh, any requests anymore for uh, for uh, official letters so um, it solved our issue and, and it seems to have resolved the issue with the banks as well so just uh like I said just just something that we hadn't foreseen uh, for addresses uh, for for use of addresses so and uh, next slide is just showing screenshot of our the app it's very simple um, just all it is streets property lines and civic address points and they can search and so it, it it's simple solution to a, a problem that was a, a major problem for for a lot of people so and so that's all that's all i had to to show today short and sweet so thank you eve 
Yeah. And once again, it's all about consistent information for everybody. Exactly. Yeah. When you when you're uh, responsible for creating addresses, you have to try to think about who's going to use it and how. So. All right, Charmaine, who are you, and where are you going to take us? Hey, Ed. Um, I'm doing the public safety use case. Sorry. Oh. Okay, so is this um there? That is me. All right. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Uh, Charmaine here. I'm a GIS analyst for the for Fairfax County Department of Public Safety Communications, better known as Fairfax 911. Um, since Esri decided to retire ArcMap. Um, we decided to upgrade completely to Arc Pro. Um, and this presentation is how we took an outdated process and updated it. Next slide, please. Fairfax 911 is the largest uh, PSAP in Virginia and among the 10 largest in the United States. Here's an overview just to give you an idea of the necessity to ensure the CAD, that the CAD has accurate and up-to-date data. Thank you. In our last delivery to AT&T, we provided over 405,000 um, address points and over 57,000 road segments. We strive to submit NG911 data to the ESINET every quarter. Yes, computer-aided dispatch, yes. Next slide, please. The process to become NG911 compatible uh, for Fairfax County began in 2014. We were finally able to complete our first deployment to NG911 or of NG911 data in June of 2020. Just in case you did not know, NG911 is next generation 911, which replaces the analog telephone systems to digital IP based systems, changing how calls for service are routed to the proper PSAP. Prior to NG911, we relied on a tabular list of addresses. Now the information is geographic and more accurate. Next slide, please. Oh boy, here we go. This is a screenshot of the address and roads process models that took from 2014 to 2018. Uh, the old address process had eight steps. Because we have four address layers, four distinct separate address layers, conversion, projection, and interpolation is needed to meet the NG911 standards. So the county itself has over 350,000 address points. Then we also take in the city of Fairfax, which is not only in the correct projection, but it has um, almost 10,000 address points. Then we have Fort Belvoir, a military installation. And for anyone who has worked with the military um, knows that sometimes their addressing is just not that right. So, but we uh, take their addresses around uh, 2,700. And then we also have generic address points which fluctuate, um, but at the time of our latest delivery, we had about 17,000. Okay, here's the nitty gritty. So we took those eight steps and generated this model. Um, this is the addressing model only. We have a separate model for our roads. Um, the beginning of the process takes the four distinct address uh, feature classes and prepares them for the NG911 data model. The ETL process, which is in the red bubble in the center, um, takes the output of the four address feature classes, adding the necessary fields and populates the attribute tables. The final output 
is taking all of the addresses, appending them together, and clipping to our PSAP provisioning polygon. So starting on the left, we take all the address sources because they do not all have the same fields or projections to meet the NG911 schema. Next slide, please. This is a close-up of the ETL process. Um, it takes the four distinct um, address feature classes, preparing them for the NG911 data model as the necessary fields and populates them. The complete model also has a QA, QC process to change uh, blanks to null values, check for duplicates, and any addresses outside of our PSAP boundary, among other things. And that's my presentation. Thank you for joining and listening. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you, Ed. We have a special bonus slide from Kara. Am I right, Kara? Hello, yeah. Um... I guess we could consider it a bonus slide uh, because this slide is going to talk about all of the reasons that addressing is important outside of these reasons that we've been talking about when it comes to emergency response. And so some of some of us have already touched on that, uh, such as the, the mortgage situation, but I wanted to expand on it because there's so many reasons that, I mean, impact our daily lives uh, that, that come from spatial analysis utilizing accurate addressing. And so I'm gonna start with just talking about the decennial census planning and logistics that are based on address points, which means accuracy of addressing is important to obtain accurate location-based demographic data. The demographic data, the population density, all of those statistics go into the different types of funding that are funneled down from the, the government into our hospitals, into our schools into those really highly necessary programs, into our roads, into the networks that we depend on every day to get from place to place. And so the decennial census in itself is a really important aspect of why accurate addressing is important because they utilize those address points to go around and collect um, every 10 years. So addressing also helps identify density population centers, which can then be analyzed for proximity to critical services. Uh, that doesn't just mean proximity to a service that is going to come to your home. Sometimes it's you driving to critical care. It's you having broken, broken a leg and somebody is able to drive you to a center. So it's not just how are they going to get to your home, to your address. It's also, are you in the proximity that is best for your quality of life and your ability to do what you need to do in certain situations? And so density population centers can be utilized, can be analyzed utilizing address points. So how close are you to critical services? How close are you to healthy food options? How close are you to police stations, parks, libraries, open space? All of those critical services that are important to quality of life and health and well-being. Accurate addressing can also help when custom evacuation plans are necessary. So there are situations where vulnerable population centers need more assistance, mapping population density against factors such as the ingress egress routes, access to the shelters that would be created in the in the um, in the in, in <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't think of the word and it's so easy. But in the instance that a natural disaster occurs, shelters are put up. And so where are those pop dense population centers? And then where within those dense population centers are there more vulnerable population centers? And so that, that can then help emergency planners say this is where a shelter would need to be in the instance that this type of natural disaster occurs. And proximity to survival resources, the relief centers, it can help decision makers understand which communities will be disadvantaged and when it comes to the distribution of relief resources and also emphasize those which have higher population densities, therefore may be in need of more custom emergency response. So this all is in the planning phase, right? This is all in the phase of planning, what will we do if something happens? This isn't necessarily talking about when that call is made to dispatch and then that communication is there and we need to know where are they, we need to get there quick in that instance. This is why addressing and accurate addressing comes into play when it comes to spatial analysis and why that's important. 
Another example of how accurate addressing can help is with mapping all res already existing housing and development density against demographic and socioeconomic factors to assess housing needs and then proximity to some of those critical resources that I already mentioned previously. And as a last example, accurate business addressing can help determine which communities may need to attract certain categories of business to help that community diversify, grow, and thrive. And so there's a lot that can come into play when it comes to accurate addressing and how that accurate addressing can help quality of life, health, and well-being. Thank you, Kara. You are very welcome. And now to bring this show to a close, we'll talk about the end of the address life cycle and maybe some lessons that can be learned from that. So Lauren, tell, me, tell us about the end of the address life cycle. Great, yeah. So um, thank you for sticking through this because here's the surprise ending. Addresses don't die. So even though we called this the life of addresses, the, the clincher here is that they don't actually die. So this is the eternal life of addresses. Um, there's no end they just retire. So um, there are a number of reasons why they can retire. Um, you can have a road being renamed, right? So of course, if the road is renamed, we wanna rename the addresses that are associated with the road. Um, property subdivision or consolidation. So often we see this where we have a gigantic parcel that's bought out by a developer. The developer hacks it apart, puts down a whole series of um, new homes and they no longer have need for that first initial address that represented that larger parcel, right? So at that point, we can retire the, the larger parcels address and utilize the newer addresses for the development. Um, or if there's substantial, ch substantial changes to buildings or entrances, you know, often when we're addressing something, it's, it's typically the front door that, you know, determines the, the address that you wanna utilize, the, the point from which you're accessing the road, that front door. Um, so when we're doing that, we want to retire the address. You never, ever, ever, ever want to delete an address. That's really important. Um, these addresses have been utilized for a very long time, you know, especially in some of these developments that go back for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and they're tied to a whole series of records. So, you know, deeds, wills, consensus records, uh, genealogy records, they all get tied to that. Um, so, oh, can you go back just one slide real quick? Sure. Almost done. Um, so there's the historical context with that that address, um, auditing and compliance. So retired addresses allow for auditing and compliance. Um, and then data integrity, deleting an address might break references or cause data inconsistencies. Um, sometimes when we're working with our addressing data, it's a little easy to get that tunnel vision and think that you in your business need, you are the only one who is actually utilizing that data. But sometimes these addresses are tied to other systems that you may not have knowledge of or have an understanding of how those, how those connections are being recorded. And so it's really important to understand, obviously, your stakeholders, but understand that we never want to delete addresses. Okay, sorry. Next slide. Um, how are addresses validated across systems and used? Um, so this, there's a number of ways to interpret this question, but you know, effectively, when you, you're entering your address, you can parse out the address for validation purposes. You know, a lot of us GIS people, we know that we can utilize domains. Um, so as we have like those street types and things like that, we're able to make sure that we're spelling Avenue the same way across the board, our, our directionals, everything gets spelled the same. Um, this is preventing, you know, a series of addresses from having misspellings as you go down the street, and so they don't really work cohesively together as a group. Um, verification, uh, parsing um, can be compared against authoritative databases. For correction, you know, you could be, you know, mixing, you can be fixing typos, um, adding missing attributes. We see that a lot where um, somebody started creating an address and they got a phone call and they forgot to finish filling out the attributes for that address um, or reformatting the address. Sometimes that's necessary as well. And then lastly, geo geocoding. So for geocoding these addresses, we can see, well, how does this address compare with my road centerline data set? A lot of our road centerline data sets have low and high numbers on our streets. And we can see how do these addresses work with the range that's assigned to the street. Um, you know, additionally, you might have a parcel layer that has information. And so you're, you're pitting all these things against each other to validate that data and make sure that it's solid. Um, I apologize with the typer on here. The NDSI is actually the NSDI. Um, so that is the National Spatial Data Infrastructure that's providing a framework for collecting and sharing spatial data. 
including addresses. And then the NAD, the National Address Data Set, I believe. Database. Database. Yes. Thank you, Ed. National Address Database. So many acronyms, guys. Um, that's supported by the NSDI and aggregating the address data from various sources, ensuring that it meets national standards. So there's some collaboration and partnerships there. Um, and then both of these are, you know, promoting open data policies. And on here, we also have some tech companies that are listed that are doing data collection and verification and data sharing. Next and slide, please. One once you re release these uh, addresses out into the public, these other systems and, and uh, applications will pick them up. And if you then delete an address at some point, they'll come back and ask you for it. And you'll spend a crummy Friday afternoon trying to figure out what happened. So this is why you never delete an address. They don't die. They just yeah. retire. And, and that brings up another point too, is, is documentation is so crucial. Um, you know, especially when working with our data, it's really good to document why certain changes were made. So I really recommend putting yourself in a position to be able to back up any changes that were made to your data and just have the documentation because it's really hard to memorize thousands and thousands of addresses. And if you have to come back years later and understand why a change was made, really good to have that documentation. Um, so lessons learned. Um, again, I come from public safety. Addresses never die. Don't recycle unique keys. Our addresses have unique keys. Um, you know, often when they're working their way into the public safety portion of the pipeline and they're going into the CAD system, the CAD system is tying to that unique key associated with that address and it's recording information. So I always give the example of a caution note. First responder goes to an address. There's something at that address that's really important for them to know. Maybe there are hazardous chemicals, really dangerous individual at that location, something like that. They'll take a caution note. It gets tied to the address through that unique key. So please don't recycle unique keys. We don't want to do that. Think about growth and expansion, right? So those that example I showed you earlier with that crazy um, country club road, right? North end of that road, there's really no allowance for growth and expansion without getting really wonky with some of that addressing. So think about that. Think about phonetics, spelling, no special characters. Um, a lot of CAD systems, computer-aided dispatch, again, public safety, we start doing special characters, it starts throwing off the system. So for example, if you have a, an address that's 236 and a half, um, that half requiring the one slash two, when it goes into a CAD system can be problematic because some CAD systems see the slash and interpret that as an intersection. So it might think of it as like, is this the intersection of Pine Street and slash Spruce Street? That slash can kind of mess it up. So just be thinking about things like that. Have a singular addressing authority, and that even includes sub addressing. You might have your developers come in, and you know you 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 have an authoritative. Well, this this is the street name. These are the numbers you can use. But if you let the the developers do the sub addressing, um, they can get a little too creative, and and you definitely want to guide those conversations and have the authority, because again, we want to have consistency. We don't want to be. I'm sorry, I'm so public safety oriented, but first responders, we don't want to be throwing them surprises. Um, at the last second and, and throwing off how they can get to that location in a timely manner. That's really not what we need to do. Um, think about the feedback loop for your addresses. So be thinking about all your stakeholders, who needs to be notified. Do you have a really good system in place for getting those notifications out? Make sure that none of them fall through the cracks um, and just making sure that you know if, if the public safety communications department or you know, your center, hey, we're finding that this address is missing. This address is missing. And they go back and they communicate that to the addressing authority, the addressing coordinator. It's important that that address gets incorporated. So the next time that data gets delivered up to the public safety, that address is included, right? Because somebody calls 911 and the call taker says, I can't find your address. They're kind of sweating. They're taking some time to get that address into the system. If that same person calls back two weeks later, it's inexcusable to have that same problem, right? Because we've already been notified of it. So make sure you have that really strong feedback loop, figure out who has to be at the table and bring them to the table and have that communication. Um, that's that's really, you know, um, I think a, a big thing that sometimes gets missed is, is we have all these different um, entities involved with addressing and how addresses are utilized. Um, and then, you know, GIS people, right? Let's see how these addresses impact our other layers. When you're adding an address into your addressing database and it's making its way into your, your addressing GIS later, layer, is it also being looked at and how does that relate to your RCL? So um, your road center line. So just be thinking about all these things and how they all work together in tandem. I apologize, that was really fast, but I think it's really important. Okay, 
And I'll add to that from more of the address administration point of view, yeah. um, since I don't have a public safety background, understand your address reference system. Everything flows from that. Develop consistent procedures and make them public. Be aware of all the organizational processes that use address data and seek to serve them. So that means organizing your address data so that it can serve the full range of purposes, not just NG911, not just planning, not just uh, permitting, one GIS, many views. And with that, we'll bring it to a close. Um, here's some information on the committee uh, that, that put this together. If you wanna get involved, uh, contact Matt Garricky, he's the chair. And we'll have a conference coming up in uh, January. So uh, uh, be aware of that. And I see that there are over a hundred comments and questions posted uh, in our eight minutes left. Danielle, are you going to be the one who, the raffle uh, administrator who picks the lucky questions that get asked? Um, I can be. Why right. don't we, we will start with the ones in the Q&A. Yeah, um, start with the Q&A. Okay. So Angela Johnson asks, is there a general, is there a general status that prohibits streets to be named after a person? Sometimes we have developers or residents who want to rename or name a street after a person, even though we don't encourage streets to be named after a person, but we do not have anything official to support our reason not to name a street after a person. That is entirely a matter of local uh, government. And so the answer to that is to have someone enact a policy. If it's council, then uh, maybe it's, it's the local council, for example that prohibits or that, that that says what names can be given and what names cannot. And that's a good a good one to not, you know, to prohibit. So I'll I'll, I'll take that one. Next. Okay. Um that is oh, I have another one that just came in. Can I can I add to that one too? Yeah. Sure. Um also I'd also be mindful if the the structure of the person's name, right? So if it's doctor so and so, we're putting a, a DR at the front end of that name, which you know, can add some confusion. Is that DR for drive or DR for doctor? So just also be thinking about the specifically if if you are going to allow names, also be thinking about specifically that actual name and how it's going to come across. All right, Danielle, who's next? Um, so it looks like we have a comment and then a question. If you can add an attribute attribute field into your schema, active, proposed, retired, etc. Um, I'm not sure if there was perhaps a previous question posed to that one. So if the individual asking it could maybe type uh, if there is a previous question. Uh, moving forward, we'll go. Rebecca asks, when doing the sub addressing, is it good to include rooms with assigning apartment numbers? Who wants to take that one? Raise a hand. Okay, Lauren, you, you talked a bit about sub addressing. What, you wanna take a crack at that one? Um, well, there's a note here that says uh, Danielle would like to answer the question live, but I'm not sure. But um, okay, that was an, oh, okay. Um, when doing some addressing, it's good to include rooms with signing apartment numbers. Well, so I, I can't help but think of the Nina standards, right? So I'm, I'm thinking about public safety, the National Emergency Number Association, and the GIS data model and what it can support. So this addressing data, as it works its way through its pipeline and starts being utilized from public safety, I can tell you that the NINA standards do support a high level of um, granularity with your addresses. So you can be putting, putting in things like floor and units and seat and all this stuff like that. So that's my perspective, but I'm not sure if, if the group has some other contributions to add. No, I'm sorry, everybody. I because I'm presenting and I'm on screen share, maybe I'll just take off the screen share then I can see what the chat is too. But Danielle, go ahead and and, um, and open it up. Okay, um, so that's all of the questions in the Q&A. Um, in the chat, we have a lot of comments and questions, so I will do my best to kind of go back through them. Bear with me just a moment. Um, and, and have this let us know when we have to close, because I know that you've got a few things that you want to put up also, Danielle. We've got about five minutes. Um, so this was a great presentation. Thank you all for providing this. You have done a wonderful job today. Um, Thank you. 
there was a comment to Kara. Uh, I think we all have had frustrating experiences with this GPS navigation vendors. Still, the message of not deleting addresses is very important. I think that applies to most data in general. And, and can I add to that also the, the reverse concept, too, of these streets um, that have not yet been built? Um, we want to be really cautious about adding in streets um, and addresses into our data that are not yet there. So it's tricky, right, because we want to make sure we have the address there. So as Ed was saying, you know, if somebody gets bitten by a snake on site and they're building it, we can respond to it. Um, but, you know, if we're also thinking about road center lines and things like that, um, be thinking about, you know, platted versus what's actually there, because for routing purposes, we don't want to be putting in streets that are not actually accessible to first responders. So that's sort of the, 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 second, the second portion to think about as we're doing our addresses and, and how they relate to other GIS layers. Um, we'll do maybe two more questions and then we'll just share some upcoming ERISA events. So honorary street names where the legal name remains the same for addressing purposes, but an honorary street name sign is installed, which can be useful as an alias street name is one method to have both ways. I think that might be a comment to maybe changing of the name earlier. Um, and then is it advisable to apply addresses to assets such as boat docks, street signs, trail markers, et cetera? Hillary, why don't I toss this one to you? You got an opinion? Uh, Hillary had another meeting that oh, she had to sorry. step away to. I do apologize. All right, Eve, I'll pick you. Um, <laughs> that's a tough one. It's a, I guess it, it depends on the situation. Uh, we, we have assigned, um, some addresses to, uh, let's say like a trailhead or, um, uh, you know, places where, um, I get, I, yeah, places where people would gather or, or be often enough that there may, uh, be a need for, uh, to, you know, if somebody might call 911 from that location, um, so I guess it it depends on the situation and 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 the uh, the location I would say. Charmaine, would you agree? Yeah, I was gonna add that um, we have like uh, just like Eve was saying is that if it's a, a highly trafficked area and we know that somebody is because uh, we have boat docks, um, we have mile markers on our trail markers, so we actually have address locations that we have a type. For, um, but the street signs are more of an infrastructure asset, so I would not necessarily assign an address, but um, like public works could definitely have a, a, a table of XYs and a list of their assets, uh, something like that. But as far as the address feature, I would not uh, suggest um, that. And, you know, boat docks and Boat docks can be blown away in a hurricane or a severe storm. Um, so possibly having an accessory structure um, table or layer, that would be advisable uh, if you wanted to keep track of something like that. Um, yeah, but that's that's what, uh, but the trail markers are definite. Uh, we do have those um, in, our in our CAD addresses uh, for the simple fact that we have a lot of trails. Woody areas don't always have um, cell reception, and if they do, then at least the the caller can say, "I'm past mile marker such and such," or that was the last one I saw. Um, so yeah, I think uh, having the trail markers and mile markers would definitely be a great um, asset to your CAD data. I'm thinking though that if the infrastructure pieces or assets are along a roadway. You could assign a number that's consistent with the numbering system numbering rules you've got, and that would enable people to find it along that roadway. So that's possible too. With that, we'll close and turn it back to Danielle. Thank you, Danielle, for putting on this production. Um, thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists today. Everyone did an outstanding job um, addressing questions about the life of addresses. I just want to share briefly um, upcoming events at ERISA. We have some upcoming webinars on September 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Scary to think that we are almost to September. Co-producing data and tools for climate adaptation planning 
an introduction to the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Centers. And then on October 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern, beyond the headlines, the practices and policies to improve the use of GIS for pandemic response and public health. We always have new webinars coming in, so please check back on our ERISA page for webinars and virtual education. Upcoming ERISA programs, the GIS Leadership Academy, November 18th through 22nd in Fort Worth, Fort Worth Texas, excuse me. And then the Virtual GIS Leadership Academy. Uh, registration will open soon, but that is December 2nd through 6th. And of course, last but not least, the GIS Pro 2024 Conference in Portland, Maine. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing and thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you to, oh, and LEAP 2025, of course, absolutely. Um, in January of 2025, scary to think that's only a few short months away. But thank you to all of our panelists today. Thank you to all of our learners for attending today. We wish everyone all the best. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you all. And Danielle, will you save the chat comments and Q&A? Yes. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, all, and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you.